Gary Gensler and the SEC are seeking $2 billion in fines and penalties against Ripple. And Grayscale's chief legal officer is saying the Ethereum ETF, the spot ETF, is still possible despite the SEC not saying much. And London Stock Exchange is getting ready to list Bitcoin and Ethereum ETNs. This is very bullish. We're going to break this down and much more. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. If you are new here, please hit that subscribe button as well as a thumbs up button and leave a comment below. If you're listening on a podcast platform such as Spotify or Apple, please leave a five star rating and review. It supports the podcast and it doesn't cost you anything. Well, folks, we got to start by talking about Bitcoin. Bitcoin pumped today. It's currently over $70,000. It in fact touched $71,000 today. Incredibly bullish. And we're seeing the altcoins are starting to move a little bit as well following Bitcoin's move. Ethereum is back over $3,600, BNB at $590, Solana at $189, XRP just over $0.64. Cents. Dogecoin has the number eighth spot at $0.17, cents. Cardano at number nine at $0.66, cents. and Avalanche AVAX at number 10 at $58. So let's look at the Bitcoin chart here. We are seeing on the daily chart, three green candles in a row with a small green candle forming right now. We do have to let this still prove itself. Some are going to say, see, Bitcoin's headed to 85,000 and 90,000. I don't know that yet. I'm waiting for further confirmation. However, I am seeing breadcrumbs. I'm seeing indications that we are on the upward movement but it still has to play itself out. A good positive sign is that the DXY, in comparison to Bitcoin, is forming red candles on the daily chart. So two red candles, with the second being a small red candle. This is what I've been sharing with you guys for weeks, saying we're waiting for the DXY to start breaking down because that will be great for Bitcoin and risk assets. This is very great what we're seeing here, folks. Good news. It could be that we're turning the corner and heading back up as we head into April, for the Bitcoin having, and Bitcoin could make a move between eighty-five to ninety thousand dollars. That's what I'm projecting. I could be wrong, so I'm leaving it out there that I don't have a crystal ball. But I'm looking at different scenarios and what has the highest probability of playing out. And if Bitcoin continues on this trajectory, we could head to over uh, eighty thousand, of course, and possibly touch ninety thousand. Exciting times, folks! Exciting times and. Even if you don't hold Bitcoin, this is a great sign because the liquidity will flow from Bitcoin to the altcoins. Bitcoin is the rising tide that lifts all boats. That is how the market has played out historically and what we're seeing playing out right before our eyes. But like I said, I'm personally waiting for further confirmation. I'm going to turn incredibly bullish once Bitcoin crosses $74,000. It breaks that all-time high that is set um, just a couple of weeks ago. So we have to be patient and let it play out. Now, let's take a look at the top trending coins on social media. This data is brought to you by Sentiment, which provides great crypto metrics and analytics and data that you can use to be a more informed investor. So first that's trending is ICP, the internet protocol with high positive sentiment. This is really great. Uh, let's see why it's trending. It says here that ICP is trending due to achieving entry and take profit targets on various exchanges like Binance Futures, Bybit USDT, and KuCoin Futures. ICP is trending due to significant gains in the crypto market and the emergence of internet computer as a top gainer. So price action is sending uh, ICP trending here on social media. Coming in at number two is Ondo with great positive sentiment. Bitcoin here at number three um, because the price has been moving, of course. USDT on Avalanche is still trending here at number four. Dogecoin trending at number five. USDC on Optimism is trending here at number six, you have Yield Guild Games, YGG trending at number seven, Pack Protocol at number eight. Uh, we have LTO Network. I've never heard of that. LTO uh, trending here with positive sentiment. And Chainlink comes in at number 10. I'm very bullish on Chainlink, and it has high positive sentiment. So uh, these are your top trending tokens on social media.
Now let's jump into the news. We got big news coming out from the SEC and scumbag regulator Gary Genser. Here's what Stuart Alderati of Ripple, he's the chief legal officer, had to say. As you will see, when the SEC's brief is made public tomorrow, they ask the judge for $2 billion in fines and penalties. That is unless, of course, you pay me $100 billion. Gary Genser uh, doing his best Dr. Evil impersonation here. Our response will be filed next month, but as we all have seen time and time again, this is a regulator that trades in statements that are false, mischaracterized, and designed to mislead. They stay true to form here. Rather than faithfully applying the law, the SEC remains bent on wanting to punish and intimidate Ripple and the industry at large. We trust the court will approach the remedies phase fairly. So scumbag regulator Gary Genser at work here, right? Um, and here's what Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse had to say on the matter. Gensler's SEC has repeatedly acted outside the law, not going unnoticed by judges admonishing the agency for a gross abuse of power entrusted to it by Congress. This is from the debt box case. Of course, the SEC just got sanctioned by the judge in the debt box case. And for acting without faithful allegiance to the law, this is what Judge Sarah Netburn said in the Ripple case, let's not also forget Genser's lack of attention to Sam Bankman fried and Brad calls him SB fraud. <laughs> uh, remember, Sam Bankman fried was meeting with Gary Genser in the SEC. He met with them multiple times. FTX officials met multiple times with the SEC. The SEC did not do their job and their due diligence here. And clearly, massive fraud was taking place behind the scenes. Brad continues. He says the SEC plans to ask the judge for $2 billion in the case that involved no allegations, let alone findings of fraud or recklessness. Remember, there's no fraud in this case. There is absolutely no precedent for this. We will continue to expose the SEC for what they are when we respond to this. Um, and here, former SEC of director, regional director, Mark Fagel, he's now retired, weighed in on the $2 billion fine. He said, absurdly high number, and they won't get anything close, presumably aiming high, hoping for a split the baby result, but I don't see that happening. So uh, this is interesting, guys. Um, <laughs> the SEC just trying to get its pound of flesh, but it's doing so in an unlawful way. And we've been talking about it. The agenda here is to stifle and kill crypto startups so Gary Genser's Wall Street banking buddies can come in and take over. Um, they can't kill this technology. The genie's out of the bottle. The train is off the station. This thing is here to stay. And it's disrupting uh, the TradFi incumbents who are pulling the strings of Elizabeth Warren and Gary Genser. Now, the great thing is the industry is going on the offensive, suing the SEC, beating them in court. Here, Amanda Tuminelli, who's the chief legal officer at the DeFi Education Fund, said today, we at the DeFi Education Fund sue the SEC. It has everything to do with airdrops, plus stopping the SEC's regulation by enforcement crusade against our industry. We raise two claims. Claim one, our co-plaintiff, Biba, I've never heard of that, did a free airdrop of Biba tokens and seeks a court order declaring that its free airdrop was not a securities transaction and Biba tokens are not investment contracts. As the name suggests, free airdrops do not include any investment of money by token recipients. Biba tokens and the airdrop itself are not securities under the Howey test. While that logic seems easy to follow, that has not stopped the SEC from enforcing against token creators for doing free airdrops in the past. Yeah, it's ridiculous that the SEC would go after somebody who's giving away free tokens. You're not investing any money. There's no contract, right? It's ridiculous, but it's clear overreach by the SEC and scumbag regulator Gary Genser. So they, uh, she says here, like many businesses who use digital assets, Bebo lives in fear that it will get a subpoena or face an enforcement action from the SEC. Thankfully, Bebo is allowed to sue pre-enforcement rather than wait to face actions that could put it out of business. Folks, we're seeing this trend. Companies are suing even if they've never gotten any type of enforcement action or subpoena or uh, uh, Wells notice or anything like that from the SEC. Uh, case in point, Legilex out of Texas 
with a, a crypto advocacy group sued the SEC. So this is great. This is beautiful. I hope more people team up with the crypto advocacy groups in the industry and sue the hell out of Gary Genser, get their heads spinning with litigation that he's going to be crying to Congress for more money and be put to shame, uh, even though he's got no shame. We've seen that in the past. So claim two, she says here, uh, DEF and Biva bring a claim under the Administrative Procedures Act challenging the SEC's pattern of regulating by enforcement and finalizing without opportunity for public notice and comment. An overboard rule that all, nearly all digital assets are investment contracts and nearly all digital asset transactions are securities transactions. Um, she says here, let's be real. We in this industry know that the SEC absolutely has this finalized rule and they purposely uh, haven't done a rulemaking. We have seen the SEC consistently enforce this rule through actions against businesses big and small like Biba in this industry. Now she goes on, but I'm not going to read the entire thread, but that's the TLDR or the gist of what's happening here. I love it. I love it. I love it. The industry taking off the gloves, going after the bully. Sometimes that's what you got to do with a bully, right, guys? You got to fight back to stop it. But uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. And Gary's losing in court. Um, and we're going to talk about Ethereum. But before we do, quick word from our sponsor, and that is Uphold. Uphold is one of the top exchanges out there that you can buy Bitcoin and altcoins. You can also trade precious metals on this platform, gold, silver, palladium, and platinum. I've been using Uphold since 2018. They are fully reserved. You can go review their proof of reserves. They have a great app. And uh, I've interviewed the CEO, the CFO, and many representatives. So if you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Now, Craig Salm, uh, he's the chief legal officer at Grayscale, had some thoughts to share about the Ethereum spot ETF and, and the current situation with the SEC. He said, recently, there's been a lot of chatter about the spot Ethereum ETFs. I personally am not deterred by it, and I believe that the ETFs should be approved. But right now, I want to talk about how I think perceived lack of SEC engagement should be viewed at this point. In the final moments leading up to the Bitcoin ETF approval, Grayscale and others received positive and constructive engagement from the SEC. We had thoughtful conversations and discussed the finer details of creation slash redemption procedures, cash versus in-kind, APs, LPs, custody, etc. All of these issues were figured out and are identical when comparing spot Bitcoin to Ethereum ETFs. The only difference is rather than the ETF holding Bitcoin, it holds Ether. So in many ways, the SEC already has engaged and issuers simply have less to engage on this time. Perhaps I will feel differently as we get closer to approve slash deny dates in late May 2024. But at this point, I don't think perceived lack of engagement from regulators should be indicative of one outcome or the other. Now, here's the thing, though, I get what he's saying, and he, he may be a little bit biased here because he's trying to get it done and he's putting out a public statement here. But I look at this holistically. There is still the Ethereum as a security question. I'm not saying Ethereum is a security. I'm saying Genser, <laughs> from what we've been seeing and his refusal to answer before Congress is Ethereum a security or not, uh, is a big roadblock. Here And we see that two senators randomly sent a letter to the SEC saying don't approve any other ETFs. Where did that come from? I've been telling you guys, I think that is a strategy by Elizabeth Warren and Gary Genser. I don't think these senators just woke up and said no more ETFs, right? They, they don't even know what the hell is going on. Many of them don't know what's going on. So I think, and they were both Democrats now. So you know Elizabeth Warren's pulling the strings here. So there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty around Ethereum. From the regulator standpoint, we saw Rostin Benham, chair of the SEC, literally two weeks ago before Congress said, I don't know what's happening with the SEC and Prometheum. They're calling Ethereum a security. We view it as a commodity. Why the hell would he say that? <laughs> right? So clearly, there's confusion here. And I, I think you know, the industry will have to take Gary to court again. I don't think he's going to give in that easy. I think he's going to die in this hill. And they, they're going to have to beat him in court. I believe they will beat him in court, just like they did with the uh, Bitcoin ETF. So uh, he says, I further, I agree 100% with what others like Paul Grewal and Brian Contens have said. Why spot Ethereum ETF should be approved? Consistency with ETH futures, ETFs, regulation of ETH futures as commodity futures versus security features, high correlation between futures and spot. That's one of the major 
points of why Gary will lose because they allowed the Ethereum futures ETF, but it still doesn't um, address what we've been hearing <laughs> that they want to make Ethereum a security. Uh, investors want and deserve access to Ethereum in form of a spot Ethereum ETF, and Grayscale believes the case is just as strong as it was for the spot eBitcoin ETFs. We look forward to engaging with the commission on these important products. I hope he's right. I hope the Ethereum spot ETF gets approved, but I don't think it's going to be that easy like the Bitcoin ETF based on all the facts we are seeing, based on what the CFTC chair literally said before Congress, right? So uh, I think we'll have to go to court and beat the hell out of Gary Genser once again. Now, bullish news coming out of the UK here, folks. London Stock Exchange to launch Bitcoin and Ethereum exchange traded notes market. Folks, game theory playing out right before our eyes. We've been talking about it on the podcast. United States approves this body TF. Now London wants to get in the game. Hong Kong has been talking about this. You're going to see major financial districts, jurisdictions, countries, and more, much more launch ETNs, ETPs, ETFs, all of that jazz. It's happening, folks. The on ramps being built for more capital to come into this market. And we are still early. And remember, th th these are hard assets. Many of these cryptos, they're capped and it's real time on the blockchain. Some have been lost that can't be recovered. It's incredible what's happening, and uh, it's a global asset class. It doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. If you have internet connection, you can access it. You can buy a fraction of it. If you compare that to other assets, not every stock exchange is available around the globe, right? For example, some people in India cannot access the New York Stock Exchange and, and all that, right? Uh, but this asset class, because it's all connected on the same chain, the same blockchain, real time, can participate and be part of the financial network. Network effects, Metcalf's law is playing out here, and this makes the, the, the network more valuable. That's why some people don't understand why is Bitcoin, why are these cryptocurrencies having so much value, right? They don't understand these dynamics because th this is not explained to them by Jim Cramer on TV uh, because he's just there to make you exit liquidity, right? But when you do the research, when you take time to understand these principles and, and how disruptive this technology is and how unique it is versus what has been around in the history of the world, it's it's amazing, folks. So they're looking to launch this in May. So the exchange said Monday it will start accepting Bitcoin and Ether ETN proposals on April 8th after the UK's Financial Conduct Authority updated its stance on such securities. Big news here, folks. Remember, starts a Bitcoin, starts at ETH. Eventually, all coins are coming. Uh, we'll have to wait for those altcoins. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're six months away. There's gonna, it's going to be a while, but they're coming. We're, we're, it's just crawl, walk, run. And you're going to see baskets of uh, altcoins as well. That's the news, folks. Very bullish. Bitcoin moving. Good sign here on the daily. Let's hope it keeps going. I'm waiting for further confirmation, but this is a great sign. Very bullish. Like I said, it'll be awesome to enter April with bullish momentum heading into the having. Now, heads up, folks, I will be at the D.C. Blockchain Summit, which will be in Washington, D.C., of course, on May 15th and 16th. This is being put together by the Chamber of Digital Commerce. You can buy tickets. I'll be there. I'd love to meet you guys. May 15th is the summit. That ticket, to be fully transparent, is more expensive. There's a lot going on that day. The cheaper ticket is on the 16th, which is the Blockchain Education Day, where you can get to go to Capitol Hill and meet with legislators and so forth. So we can go make our voices heard. So if you're going to be in the D.C. area, uh, you can buy the ticket and you can get a discount using my code Thinking Crypto. So once again, if you're able to uh, come, you know, uh, I would love to meet you guys and you can shoot me an email if you're going to be there. Happy to meet up, happy to talk crypto and much more. But uh, this is the work we got to do, folks. Um, and there's going to be many great speakers at the summit. Hester Peirce, Patrick McHenry, Cynthia Lummis, Congressman Mike Floods, Caitlin Long, and Senator Kristen Gillibrand. Many big names here, folks. So I'm looking forward to this for sure. And uh, I'll do some podcasting there as well. All right, folks, hit that thumbs up. Hit the five-star rating on the podcast platform. Sign up for my free email newsletter on Substack. Link in the description. Follow me on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, all the social platforms. It supports the podcast, guys. Doesn't cost you anything. Link in the description. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll talk to you all later.